Hi, it's Robin. I've got here a fairly unusual and interesting disc. I'll take it out of the sleeve. It's the Epex 1984 preview disc for the Commodore 64. I think it's interesting for two, maybe even three reasons. It's one of the very first examples of a game preview disc or a game demo disc which became very popular later in the 80s and especially into the 90s. They were often included on the cover of magazines, whether it was a floppy, five and a quarter, or often three and a half inch, or later a CD on the 16 and then eventually 32 bit platforms like the Amiga, MS DOS, Windows PC, and even some game consoles. This may be where that all started. Next, the preview disc itself contains modified, cut down, and time limited versions of the games previewed. Silicon Warrior, Breakdance, the famous Impossible Mission and Summer Games, Puzzle Panic, and the World's Greatest Baseball Game. Often it seems 8-bit games were just released once and never modified again, not even when there were bugs. So I always think it's really interesting when there's alternate versions of some of these classic games. Finally, it's the disc itself. It's an example of a very rare thing called a chroma disc. So I think there's a lot to cover today. So first we'll talk about chroma discs, and then we'll take a look at each of the games on the disc. And then finally, for you fellow programmers, we'll break out the machine language monitor and take a look at one example of the changes made for these game previews. As always, there's a chapter index to jump ahead if you're not interested in certain sections. Okay, so what's a chroma disc? As I was showing you, it's a rare kind of disc where there's printing directly on the disc. The vast majority of discs that were sold had labels on them. And especially it was rare to find full color printing on both sides. So it's interesting that they printed the instructions directly on the disc. And down here on the bottom left, copyright 1984 Epics. And on the right, that's how we know about the Chroma Disc name, Patent Pending. So there's not a lot of information available about Chroma Disc, but here in the February 1985 issue of Creative Computing, on page 12, there's an article, Record Album Discettes. Memron, a San Jose floppy disk maker, has developed a process, Chroma Disk, to print full color images directly onto a diskette carrier. Says Bill Bollinger of Memron, of course it's not fair to judge a word processing package, spreadsheet, or educational program by the way it looks. Nevertheless, he added, people will always tend to judge a book by its cover. A secondary benefit of printed diskette carriers is prevention of commercial piracy. Dishonest stores will have a difficult time selling a black copy of a disk that should be printed. Atari historian Kay Savitz found some information on this in the November 14th, 1983 issue of InfoWorld. This is by the, at least at the time, famous consulting editor John C. Dvorak from the Hot Stuff Department. It started with a mysterious phone call. The voice on the other end whispered, Dvorak, if you like colored floppy disks, then a new Silicon Valley startup named Memoron will blow your mind. I was intrigued. If you're a software vendor that hasn't been secretly contacted by Memoron yet, Call the company if you're interested in this tremendous marketing tool. Memron has designed special equipment to do four-color lithographic printing on the vinyl diskette jacket. The examples I saw were fantastic. The company starts with special white vinyl jackets and prints on them using custom-made presses. The jackets are then folded around the media. The minimum order is as low as a thousand units. Here's an opportunity for every egomaniac to put his or her picture on the floppy. You can have instructions for use printed on the disc jackets. President Bill Bollinger, pictured holding a sample, told me that besides being a great merchandising tool, these discs have an anti-piracy function. Whereas the colored label can be easily copied and printed in, say, Singapore, try copying one of these discs in a garage. Already, Visicorp, Information Unlimited, and some other big firms have signed up to have Memron make their diskettes. I predict that within the next two years, the black diskette will be a curiosity. It may return in vogue, though. 
In 1990, someone will say, hey, where did you get that neat black diskette? Look for the printed diskette to be the most copied good idea in the years ahead. Well, Dvorak, you were wrong. <laughs> You'd think there would be more examples of these discs, but there's actually very few available. Although maybe by making this video, more people will find some examples. Now on Twitter, Paul Rickards did show some images of these memo discs that he had. These are apparently blank chroma discs. They would probably stand out nicely in your collection. Now here in the March 1984 issue of Personal Computing Magazine, on page 230, there's an ad for those same blank discs. As it says, take a memo. Professional quality blank storage diskette for personal computers. I don't think that writing should be over the floppy disk surface there. And as it says, not just another diskette. Memoron. Down the bottom left corner, copyright 1983 Memoron. Patents pending on multicolored diskette enclosure fabrication and lamination processes. And there's their address in San Jose. And another article in Easy Home Computer Magazine on page 12 of the June 1984 issue. This article labeled Bright Disc Cover E. Discovery. Haha. -ha. In the days of the Model T Ford, the story goes, you could get a car in any color you wanted as long as it was black. In the area of floppy disks, we've been living in a similarly drab period. A company called Memron in California is trying to change all that. Memron now makes two different categories of floppy disks, both of them in colorful clothing. The first category is their memo line of floppies, which you will soon be able to buy at your nearby computer store. These will be packaged as five or ten packs in clear plastic boxes and clear plastic sleeves to show off their colorful jackets. The second category of production is specialty jackets. For example, Apple Computer wanted a few thousand with the famous Apple logo printed on them for in-house use at their plant. One look at the disc and you will know immediately where it came from, what it is, and where it belongs. The jackets are also being specially made for software manufacturers, Waveform for example, with a different representational picture for each specific program. There are several advantages to these new jackets. First, you will probably begin to see clear packaging instead of the usual cardboard boxes. Second, your software will be easy to find since it will have a unique cover. Finally, you'll know immediately that you have an original because anything else would have the wrong disc jacket. Pirates beware. This may open up a whole new era of top 40 software. Who knows? Maybe you'll start buying programs for the cover art. Hmm, I wonder how a thriller diskette would do. Mark Brownstein. So I'm reading these in full because they're still providing new information. So I've never actually seen a picture of one of those Apple discs. So that's something to look out for. That's probably quite collectible to have an Apple Chroma disc. Actually, I'm only aware of one other example here in this blog. There's this example, Imagineering the Art of Software, which was an Australian software publisher based out of Ultimo, New South Wales. And that's on the JB Retro Collect blog. By the way, I'll provide links to everything I'm mentioning today down in the video description. And as is mentioned in the blog, the artwork shows Canberra, and Sydney landmarks along with Australian and New Zealand animals. This particular disc held personal investment management system software. And you can see it also has printing on the backside, Imagineering the Art of Software, Ultimo, New South Wales, oh, and also in Auckland, New Zealand. And I guess that Australian disc wasn't a coincidence as there was a Memron Australia there's a full page article about them on page 118 of Your Computer Australia, the June 1985 issue. In the article, there is an image for Music Calc African Latin Rhythm Template, unfortunately just in black and white. And I will not read the whole article, except it does say that Memron is in Melbourne, Australia. And a key to the Memron operations will be the company's desire to cater for the specialist custom made market which larger diskette manufacturers are neither interested in nor equipped to address. 
production runs will be small with initial runs of about 5,000 to 10,000 diskettes and an expected average run of between 2,000 and 5,000 diskettes. In the last paragraph, the only disadvantage of the colored diskettes is the added cost. The process adds an extra 20 to 25 cents to a disc. Some companies have balked at this, but many others realize the importance of having a product that stands out. In fact, to date, all companies that have used this diskette printing process for their products have featured the diskette in the rest of the packaging. So adding 20 or 25 cents, even Australian cents per unit per disc is actually extraordinary <laughs> at the manufacturing cost. That is a lot higher. And yet you can see how some companies would use it just because it really makes their disc stand out. So that's what Epix did here. And of course, perhaps they got cut a really good deal. But I guess business wasn't so good for Memron. Because here in the November 1987 issue of Australian Personal Computer Magazine, page 302, there's a half-page ad saying, Buying Black Diskettes? Question, question, question. Memron, the only Australian-owned floppy disk manufacturer, is now in the black diskette business in Oakley, Victoria. So obviously they decided that only doing their expensive, fancy discs wasn't making enough money. So it looks like they did get into doing high-density discs. I don't know if they survived that. I couldn't find any more information about Memron lasting past 1987. If anyone else has any information, please leave a comment. And finally, I never could find a Chroma Disc patent. Memron did get some patents. One was granted to warp-resistant, dimensionally stable jacket for magnetic recording disc, but it doesn't talk about color printing. Another one, a transfer process for forming magnetic disc memories. Somewhere in one of these memories is the evidence. And some other manufacturing patents, but couldn't find one for chroma disc. Okay, so there's all the information I could find about chroma disc. Again, check the links if you want to read some of that for yourself. Now, before we load the disc, let's take a look at the instructions which I have here. And as it notes, loading instructions on the reverse side of disc. So there's the instructions for breakdance and possible mission. I will not read those all. Puzzle Panic, Silicon Warrior. Kind of fancy layout, eh? They've angled everything. Mm. Summer Games, World's Greatest Baseball Game, telling you to change the joystick to port number one. Teams will be pre-selected. And down here in the bottom right corner, don't forget your rebate. Send in the preview disc proof of purchase seal, the proof of purchase seal from the back of the instruction manual of the Epix game you purchased, and the retail sales receipt from the game purchased Mail to the Epix Preview Disc Refund in Young America, Minnesota. Epix will refund you three bucks. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. One refund per household. Offer expires January 15th, 85. No photocopies of this rebate coupon will be accepted. Offer valid only in the continental United States. Oh, us Canadians were left out. Proof of Purchase Seal 1984 Preview Disc. That seems like a lot of work to get three bucks back. <laughs> okay, I'll set up the C64 and we'll give this a try. All right, I've got a classic Breadbin 64 and 1541 set up. Let's try loading up the disc. Load star, comma 8, comma 1. Here's a tip that works with a lot of games. Instead of pressing return, hit shift and the run stop key, and it'll automatically type run for you and boot the game. Game preview. Copyright 1984 Epics Incorporated. Okay, so here's the main menu, and it's joystick controlled. There's six games available, so we'll just go through them in order. Breakdance. Dance. 
Breakdance contains four challenging games, including an action game in which your dancer tries to break through a gain of breakers descending on him, a Simon-like game where your dancer has to duplicate the steps of the computer-controlled dancer, and even a free dance segment where you develop your own dance routines and the computer plays them back for you to watch. Now anyone can break dance. All you need is a computer. <laughs> So here we go, Breakdance, copyright 84, designed by Backtech. <laughs> what is more 80s than the Commodore 64 Breakdance game? Okay, so instead of being the full version of the game, I think this just has the Simon mode. And I'm the gray dancer. Oh, and you gotta do whatever the blue dancer does. So to spin, you press the button. So oh, two spins in a row, and it's just like Simon says, spin, oh, three spins in a row. This is an easy one. Spin, spin, one, two, three, and that was a right move. Some of the moves are a little hard to do, right? Oh, spin, 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 right. Oh, I did that, whack out. So if you get wrong, it says whack out for whatever reason. Push up, up, right, up, right, and that's a down, up, right, down, right. It's not entirely obvious. Right. Oh, there. Okay, and not only do you only get one limit, breakdance the game, there's much more to breakdance. Four play screens with action strategy. One, try to beat Hot Feet in a breakdance contest. Two, go down into battle against the Rocket Crew. Three, solve breakdance puzzles to collect break and blasters. Four, oh, we missed it. I'm too slow a reader. So anyway, <laughs> you see that not only do you only get one level, but it's time limited as well. And I think it's about a 90 second limit and the game exits and reloads the menu. How about that? Okay, so I think we'll revisit Breakdance after, and I'll do a little bit of hacking with my Super Snapshot cartridge just to show you how that time limit is implemented. All right, next, Impossible Mission. As a member of the anti-computer terrorist ACT Squad, your mission is to reach the infamous Elvin, who is holding the world hostage with the threat of nuclear annihilation. Elvin is hidden in his database installation, protected by robot defenders. Can you penetrate his complex, break into his computer system, and abort his plans? The survival of the world is in your hands. Okay, so Impossible Mission's a super famous game. Probably everybody knows about it. An all-time classic, and it was released by Epix in 1984. It's a fun game, a mix of exploration and platforming. And of course, that famous speech. So here we go. So at first it looks like the full version of the game, but normally you can activate the uh, control panel here but as the instructions note, it's disabled in this game demo. So you can't use that whole computer panel at the bottom of the screen. And additionally, him, my robot. So let's go in here. We can search for various objects. Nothing here. Well, there we got a piece of the puzzle. Lure that black ball there. Oh, there's a robot snooze key, or a card. All right, so that room's cleaned out. These control panels do work. There's no point using that. So we'll go back here and we'll see the one other major limitation of this game or of this demo. is that 
this if you look at the right side there's no exit to this room and if you look at the map there are only two rooms total Destroy him, my robot. so here we'll disable the robots And there's still that time limit. I think it's about 90 seconds again. <laughs> right, we'll try Puzzle Panic. I think later games were a lot more generous. From Ken Houston, world famous blackjack and computer game expert, comes this ultimate challenge 43 puzzles and 11 families. Families? will test your reasoning ability, logic, coordination, powers of observation, and memory. There are puzzles based on music, arithmetic sequences, colors, patterns, shapes, and much more. So put on your thinking cap, grab your joystick, and try to beat the master at his own game. I do remember that is a Ken Houston name being pretty famous. Here we go, Puzzle Panic. Press F7 to start the game. Okay. So you're this kind of light bulb thing. There's lots of question marks. It's an odd game. And I don't know, I'll go here. Okay. No, no. So <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong there, but anyway, I chose the wrong door. Uh, this time I'll choose this one. How is your memory? Okay. Now this is really tricky. It's actually kind of a neat idea. So you just always have to do things in order here. So obviously one, two, three. You see how they're uncovering other uh, blocks or whatever? So what we have to actually remember now is red, blue, yellow, green. Red, blue, yellow, green. This changes every time. So now we have to do that sequence. Red, blue, yellow but now it's these sides of shapes so four six five three four six five three we have to remember okay so four six five now i have to remember four three one two it's like you have to replace four three one two have to replace one list with another four three one two four three now is red oh no green green red oh i i forgot it already <laughs> no i blew it so it is kind of an interesting puzzle mechanic of having one list of things to remember. And as you execute that list, you have to be replacing it with another memory list. Okay, Silicon Warrior. The setting is a 3D power grid in outer space. Warriors from the House of Apple, House of Adam, House of Peanut, and House of Pawn are fighting to the death. To triumph, you must dodge, disappear, and reappear while returning enemy laser fire with stunning accuracy as you program chips in the battle grid to your color. But be prepared, your battle plan and strategy are just as important as your quickness and straight shooting. Okay. So the goal is to get five in a row here. I'm not very good at this. Okay, there, somebody else disrupted it. So the other guy got five in a row. Yeah, it's kind of like Cubert, you gotta undo somebody else's color there. I've turned my row blue. Oh, right away both guys came and undid my row. Oh, so there, somebody shot me. Okay, the yellow guy's busy now. Oh no, he's already back out. Okay, teleporting around. 
Oh. I can never get a row in this. Oh, there. Ran out of time. <laughs> I don't really like that game particularly. It's kind of an interesting uh, idea. Okay, Summer Games. This is, of course, the other huge hit for Epics. You're an Olympic athlete competing in eight key events at the Summer Games. How well can you score in track, swimming, diving, skeet shooting, pole vaulting, gymnastics, and more? So realistic, there's even an awards presentation after each event. Change into your running shoes and go for the gold. They forgot to come after diving. Oh yeah, on that Silicon Warrior, I didn't get commenting. It said the House of Peanut. That was the nickname for the IBM PC. Junior, was it? Kind of a weird nickname. I don't mind that that one disappeared. Okay, get ready for dive number one. This will be a forward dive. So basically all you get to do is play the, the diving event of Summer Games. So press the button to dive, spin. Oh, we have a belly flop there. 3.5, 2.5. Not very good scores. All right. Backwards dive. Oh, another really bad one. Well, I gotta get one good one, right? Ah. Uh, not too bad. And the last dive, the inward dive. Oh, a little bit off. Well, those were okay jumps. Or dives. Jumps. <laughs> 297 total. All you get to do is, is play that one event in Summer Games. So, I just think it's kind of neat that these are these alternate versions that the company hacked. Now, the one that you get to play the most is this World's Greatest Baseball Game. And we'll start that up. Pick your major league lineup using actual major league baseball players and team statistics, then watch the action unfold against an opponent or the computer. Two modes let you choose between managing and controlling your team or just managing. The world's greatest baseball game is everything you could ever want. Hot dogs and peanuts are not included. Well, hmm. While the program is loading, please begin to think about the teams you wish to play. This is kind of a strange screen. Well, first of all, the demo version here doesn't let you choose your teams at all. So there's nothing actually to think about. But I guess you could think, well, if I bought the full version of the game and got three bucks off, uh, then I could choose all these different matchups and so on. Another weird thing about it is how they've listed the teams on the left and then goes equal zero one like it's much more logical to me to say game number one is the 1983 baltimore game two is the 1983 phillies or whatever it, it, this is a weird layout that they've done here so even with these limitations though this is by far the most gameplay that you actually get oh yeah and the instructions said you have to change to joystick port one I guess they had more trouble hacking this game than any of the others, so they put last on the list. You have to change joystick port, and actually that menu doesn't work with joystick port one, and this game never returns to the menu. All the five other playable demos that we looked at all return to the menu, as you saw. This one does not. It's probably too tricky to modify the game to do that. Okay, here we go. So New York 78. And Boston 78. Okay, so I'm the blue team. 
I press the fire button to select the back catcher. And now the pitch is going to throw to the backstop. And you just push. Oh, threw the wrong way. And if you hit fire twice, he throws it back to the pitcher. This is a pretty good baseball game for 1984. Um, <laughs> this is pretty slow pace, so I probably won't make you sit through a whole thing here. Oh, are you still in second? The backstop seems to throw really weird. There do seem to be different stats for each player. Like uh, even throwing speed and running speed. I like how the uh, batter takes a swing and just holds it there. Like, <laughs> you know, he could go run around. He's still holding it after swinging there. Sometimes you can cause a player to uh, try to steal base and that's easy to pick him off. That's not happening here. So you see how slow the back catcher runs back? Even though, you know, obviously he can run faster. There's several times in the games where it's quite hilarious how much faster or slower the same player is capable of running. There finally the batter has uh, gone back to his stance. Oh yeah, it seems every batter is right-handed in this game too. I bat left. Oh. Is he going to try and steal home? Yeah, yeah. Somebody on third plays a little song. There, somebody's trying he's trying to steal home. Well, at least I got him. So it's kind of cool how they can decide to steal, and yet sometimes they're really stupid about it. There we go. Well, and the controls are kind of weird. I think you hold down fire and then push down to get, say, first base, and push down again to get right field. So you have to kind of fiddle around, and there's a little bit of lag on the controls, so... You don't always end up with uh, who you want. Whoops. There, I can take them out. There. <laughs> there. Look at how the uh, center fields guy is running back so slow. And that was the third out. So they should actually be running in. Everybody's waiting for him to run back to his position. Anyway. <laughs> this guy. Pretty goofy. Right, right. Okay, so I got everybody out. And now I'm going to take a turn batting. I usually do terribly at this. Oh, there. Yeah. Just out, just like that. And it's really hard to read the ball, the path of the ball. There, like, the time you have to start swinging seems to me to be too late. By the way, I like Accolade's uh, hardball game way better. Oh, look how slow my guy is. But he... <laughs> so did you see how fast my batter ran back off? He was running so slow to first base, he gets out, and then he just whips off uh, back to the dugout, like at two or three times the speed. I think you should put that into actually running to base. Put that effort in. There, finally a hit. Uh, I'm just going to stand first. Anyway, you see, you get to play a lot longer than 90 seconds here, right? Eh? Oh, I'm out. Can I run? No, he's very slow going back to the dugout. Okay, now it's the second inning. It lets you play two innings, and then it just restarts the game. 
and you're back at the first inning again. So I won't make you suffer through another inning here. Or will I? Okay. World's greatest baseball game. So we've looked at all the games on there. I don't know if you're impressed or not. Probably not. That's okay. This is for historical value. And I did get a few laughs out of it there. Okay, so now I've got my super snapshot in and we're just gonna take a look. Okay, so I'll start break dance. And what I wanna do is just show you how they hack the game to put the timer in. And we'll see if we can override that. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna press the freeze button on my super snapshot cartridge, go into the monitor. And I was doing a bit of digging around on this earlier and found that here at 8,000 hex is where these two values are loaded. One five hex is stored in 0821 and one eight hex is stored in 0822. And if you turn that into a decimal number, you get 5,400. And to pull out the old Sharp BL 545, 5,400 jiffies divided by 60 to convert into seconds is the 90 seconds that the timer for this game runs. So if we hunt through the code for that location that stores the high byte of the timer, okay, well, 8006 is where it's initialized, and 89B0, 89, I'll just disassemble a little earlier here. Here we go. So basically there's a 16-bit counter that they've inserted into the game, and it's decremented every interrupt, every 60th of a second. So the low byte is decremented. For whatever reason, they put it in high byte, low byte format instead of the normal low byte, high byte format. The 6502 doesn't really care when you're keeping track of the counter itself. It's just if you use it as a 16-bit pointer, then you must follow the low byte, high byte format. So we decrement the low byte, and if it's not equal to zero, we branch ahead to here and return. If it is zero, then we also decrement the high byte, and if it's not zero, then we just return. And otherwise, it does a little bit of cleanup here, and then it jumps to this routine at 033C. And I found that more or less all the games use the cassette buffer here, 033C, that quits the game and reloads the menu. So this, I think, is common code between all the different demos here. So they've done this fairly crude implementation, just putting a 16-bit timer that counts down and then just quits the game uh, kind of messily no matter what you're doing. So the question is, can we override that? If we had bought this preview disc back in 1984 and we were really annoyed at the 90 second limit on breakdance, could we do anything about it? Well, yeah. Okay, so the easiest thing to do is just where it has this decrement 0822, ultimately, if the 16 bit timer hasn't counted down to zero yet, all this does is returns. So instead of decrementing the counter, let's just assemble to 89AA RTS. And now instead of that decrement, the code just returns. Yeah, let's try that. Let's see if I can do any better here. Starting the game. Oh, I wasn't watching. Whack out, whoops. Okay, what does he do? Spin, spin. 
spin, point, spin, up to point, spin, up, spin, up, left, spin, up, left, up. Oh, spin, up, left, up, spin, spin, up. Spin, up, left, up, spin, right. Spin, spin, up, left, up, spin, right, spin. Two spins. Spin, up, left, up, spin, left. Oh, wacko! Back out. Oh. Okay, Frey. Oh, it's doing just lots of spins again. That's nice. Spin, 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 right. Three spins. Right, spin, 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 right, spin, spin, oh, oh, anyway, clearly we defeated the time limit, so we can just keep playing, I'm not sure this game is good enough to want to defeat the timer though, <laughs> maybe I should have set it to like 10 seconds instead, <laughs> So that's our look at the Epix 1984 preview disc. Maybe not the most amazing disc ever made for the Commodore 64, but still a very significant disc, both because of the Chroma disc, and also this was not just a preview of Epix's 1984 games, but also a preview of something that became very common in the game industry, the preview or demo disc. Thanks to my patrons for their support, Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.